Today's installment of the Mega PC Restoration is kindly supported by the folks over at NordVPN. You can head over to nordvpn.org forward slash RMC to get yourself a huge 75% discount and keep yourself secure online, or stick around after today's episode and we'll talk a little bit more about why I use NordVPN and what they have to offer. Hello cave dwellers, welcome to the cave for part three of our Amstrad Mega PC restoration. This is the Mega PC that we unboxed in part two, kindly on loan from the Swindon Museum of Computing, and since then we've put it through its paces in a live stream. Here's a clip from that. We squeezed in a solid two and a half hours of gaming on it with our special guest Daniel Ibbotson from Slopes Game Room. And me. Yes, and Alan Sugar, he was with us too. And the standout feature for us during the live stream was the quality of the image. It's a solid, crisp and colourful image coming out of that SVGA port on the back of the PC. It looked fantastic and it captured really well for the live stream. But that image quality did come at a cost and that was noise. Unlike a regular Mega Drive, we have a PSU fan and the noise from that did start to get a bit annoying by the end of the stream. So that's one of the things I hope to address today. In fact, by the end of today, I hope to have our Mega PC fully restored and that will involve retro brighting in the great British weather, which is, of course, wet and it has been for the last two weeks or so. So we'll be using our retro brighting indoor methods. We've got some metal work to restore and a whole lot more besides. And of course, Alan's with us as he has been throughout the series. Good week, Alan. Yeah, been good. I helped Apple with a new Mega PC inspired computer. Oh, very nice. What was it? It was an Apple Mac Pro combined with a cheese grater. It was great. Even to this day, Alan's trying to create the perfect hybrid. I said it was great. Yeah, we heard you, mate. Great. Like your great cheese, you know? That's the joke. We all got it, Alan. It just wasn't very funny. It's funnier than anything you've said. Do you want me to fix your Mega PC or not? My agent warned me about you. I should have listened to him. Or did you ever consider that maybe I'm miserable because You're I... You're miserable. You're not the one that's looking at shit, boy. Let's get started on the plastics then. Our fascia has turned a terrible yellow colour and you can see when I slide the door back it's a little less yellow on the Mega Drive side, suggesting it spent more time being used as a PC and the owner clearly didn't have enough fun with this. On the underside of the plastics we can see the original colour we want to get it back to and in typical British fashion the sheer mention of retro brighting resulted in a forecast of two weeks of cloud and rain. That's okay though, we're going to use our indoor retro brighting methods today, and these are relatively small pieces of plastic, so it shouldn't be too tricky to restore them. We'll want to remove the cartridge slot springs so as not to rust them out, and any other metal work we find along the way, and then give each part a good clean ready for retro brighting. If I pop this sliding cover off, you can really see how yellow this thing has turned. There's a clear line down the middle between the yellowed and the original colours. Let's throw it all in the tub then and give it a good scrub. And as we're cleaning, we'll also give the metal chassis a good clean down. It's the usual process for regular viewers. We give everything a good scrub with a cloth and with a scrubbing brush. And we'll use some baking soda if we need to, to give us a bit of grit to get into the pits and really get the stubborn dirt out. The top painted metal case came out really nicely, so we don't need to do anything with the metal paintwork, but the top and bottom of the case have started to corrode, and we'll want to stop that to prevent further damage. This is simply a case of dabbing on some white vinegar onto the rust spots, letting it go to work for 10 minutes, and then scrubbing it off again, repeating the process if we need to, if there's still some corrosion left.
Once I was happy it was removed, I did give the area a spray with some clear coat, and that's just to seal it off from oxygen and to protect it from moisture to try and stop this from happening again. Depending on how bad the corrosion is, you may want to go one step further and use some paint or some spray that's specifically made for corrosion. You'll find plenty of options in, say, a car bodywork store, but in this case it was little more than surface deep, so I think this is enough for us today. The underside of the chassis was a little rustier, so I did use some sandpaper first to work away the rust, before then using the same process of vinegar, and then sealing it once I was happy it was all cleaned up. Now I know nobody will see this, it's on the underside, but that's not the point. We want this machine to last and stand proud in the collection. And we can't have the Nintendos pointing and laughing at its undercarriage, can we, Alan? That's right. You keep your undercarriage clean and rust-free, Neil. Sound advice, Alan. Sound advice. Back to the plastics then, and for the sake of a before and after shot, here they are on some white paper, and we'll come back to that later to see the difference, or at least I hope we will, if all goes to plan. Because if you haven't seen my previous experiments in indoor retro brighting, then stick with me, I haven't gone completely mad, despite Alan's company. My experiments led me to this method of retro brighting when the sun isn't available and coming out to play. So we start by vacuum sealing the plastics into bags filled with liquid peroxide. That's peroxide with a strength of 40 volume, that's 40 vol, not 40% if you're shopping for some yourself. And the purpose of vacuum sealing is really to just reduce the amount of peroxide we need to use in the bag and make sure the plastic is completely immersed in it. It can get messy though, so do make sure you wear protective gloves as this stuff is really nasty if you get it on your skin or your retro brighting blazer. Once all the parts are sealed up I've warmed a tub of water to 50 degrees celsius and then I've used a sous vide stick to maintain the temperature and keep the water moving around the parts. So we start with warm water first just to make it easier on the sous vide stick. It would take an awful long time for all that water to be heated up from cold with just that stick. The warm water alone and the peroxide would restore our plastics but it would take quite a long time. And my experiments did find that the whole process could be accelerated if we put a full spectrum light over the top of it all in an attempt to simulate the sun. So that's what I've done and I've wrapped the whole lot in tin foil to make the light bounce around as much as possible and to keep the heat in making it easy work for that sous vide stick. Trust me there is method to this madness as I hope I'll be able to show you later in the episode. So while our retro brighting is boggling away over there, we'll turn our attention to the PSU. And I must stress at this point that what you're watching is a record of my restoration. This is not an instructional video, although you may pick up tips here and there from what I do. But in the case of the PSU, the warning labels exist for a reason on these things. So please don't put yourself or those around you in danger by working on components which have the potential to do a great deal of harm to you. Shocking behavior. Not now, Alan. This is my serious face. Mm. Let's see what's inside. Despite that picture being great on the live stream, one thing the Mega PC gave us that a real Mega Drive doesn't was a lot of fan noise. There's just one fan and that's located in the PSU here. This is a 60mm 12 volt fan and as a general rule, the smaller the fan, the faster it spins to shift air and the noisier it is. There's no fan control or signal wire, it just runs at a full 3000 RPM all the time producing about 28 to 30 decibels. It doesn't sound a lot but the constant drone does get annoying eventually. And as we're in the PSU, we'll go ahead and recap it. We've done the rest of the system, so let's finish it off. But this is where things can get dangerous. With the PSU turned on, we can see over 300 volts flowing into the large capacitor, which has a 400 volt capacity. The reading isn't accurate as we're measuring it in circuit, but it does tell us enough to know that it's dangerous. When the power is turned off, you'll often find the capacitor discharges to a much safer level, but the potential is there for it to retain a dangerous charge and we shouldn't really risk it. And less importantly, we don't want to discharge it in a way that could damage other components on the board, such as shorting large capacitors out with a screwdriver, which I'm sure plenty in the comments will tell me has worked just fine for them, but there's no denying a risk does exist with that method, so that's yours to take should you choose to. To do the job, I favour the use of a resistor to slowly bleed the charge out. This is a 5 watt 20,000 ohm resistor rated at up to 460 volts. I have it in the toolbox for just such a purpose and I simply connect each leg of the resistor to each leg of the capacitor to slowly discharge it.
To demonstrate, I've hooked up the multimeter and you can see with the power off the charge has dropped significantly. There's only around 10 volts in it here, so the capacitor is likely just fine. But imagine for a second it's holding 300 volts and to demonstrate, notice the reading on the multimeter dropping in a controlled fashion all the way down to zero as we bleed the charge away. And with that done, I'm happy the board is safe to handle. Recapping the PSU involved replacing only about 10 capacitors, there was no drama to be found in doing so and before long I had them all replaced. I didn't find any signs of leaking capacitors or problems along the way, but those found in the PSU do tend to have a shorter lifespan than others just because of the heat generated in the PSU, so it's a good preventative maintenance step. Speaking of heat, let's sort out the fan, and this wasn't as straightforward a swap out as I was hoping for. I first replaced the soldered fan wires with a couple of pins so I can plug a fan in and out. Then I found what I thought was a suitable replacement fan in a Nanoxia branded 60mm fan. It runs at a third of the speed, 2000 RPM, as the original, while giving us the same airflow, so I thought perfect, less noise for the same performance, let's just swap it out. Well that didn't quite go to plan, the 25mm uh, depth of the new fan was too deep to fit in the case, I can't close the lid here, so I needed a plan B. Instead then, I found a fan with a 15mm depth that runs at the same 3000 RPM as the original, so it offered no acoustic advantage over that original fan, but I dug deep into the spare parts box and found an old fan controller which can sit in a spare PCI slot. So now with this in place, I can lower the fan speed on a cooler day to make it quieter, and let's remember this machine was designed to be sold in Australia, so a slower fan in UK temperatures will be well within the temperature tolerances it was designed for in the Australian heat, but we do then have the option to crank it up if we need to on a hotter day. Have a listen. Sadly I have no solution for reducing the amount of hot air or noise produced by Alan. And so I said to Bruce Lee, Bruce, I'll teach you everything I know about Kung Fu. And I did. And I made him a star. Stop harassing Jackie Allen, we've got a job to do here. So that's our PSU recapped and improved. We'll turn our attention now to the final piece of the puzzle before we can put it all back together. And that's the metalwork, particularly on the back of the machine and inside under the motherboard. There are signs of rust and corrosion. And if we don't do away with that, and indeed protect it once we've removed it to stop it from coming back, it's only going to do more and more damage to the system. So let's fix this for the sake of preventing long-term damage and also just to make it look a bit nicer. While we've already dealt with the inside of the case earlier, it's almost like he filmed that scene later and edited the video together. Who the hell writes this stuff? Anyway, yes, we don't want rusty looking ports or tarnished metal, but it's not as bad as it looks to deal with. The ports themselves are just fine, we don't need to swap them out, and the metal surrounds all pop off so we can easily work on those. The problem also extends to the entire back of the PC, not just the system board plate. And my intention at first was to treat the corrosion and then prime and paint all of the metalwork with silver paint, hence why I'm masking off the stickers here to protect them, but I did quickly change my mind when I got down to work. You see, when I started prepping the metal by sanding off the surface corrosion, I quite liked the result. So I worked it several times over with the sandpaper from 400 up to 1200 grit. And the result on this test corner, as you can see, was a really nice, shiny, almost brushed metal effect. Granted, it was going to take a lot more work than spray painting to sand all of this down, but it does reduce the risk of a bad finish with the paint or hiding future corrosion underneath the paint so we can't see things getting worse. At least this way we can see the bare metal and any problems returning. So I got to work sanding. And once done, just like we did with the chassis earlier, I gave them all a few coats of clear coat just to offer some protection. And with that we can put our Mega PC all back together again, assuming that is, our retro bright experiment has gone well. The plastics have had 7 hours of cooking now, so let's take them out and we'll see what the result is. To remind ourselves how they looked before, here are those plastics again on the white paper.
and here's what they look like now. So what can we make of this then? Well we've certainly got it back to a good original colour and I'm really actually quite happy with the results here. There are some observations to be made though. Our Amstrad logo certainly looks a lot lighter without the dark yellow plastics to contrast against, but there is a lot of light reflecting on that logo in this shot. If we move to a panning shot here you can see when you get to the logo it's not quite as bad as it first looks. But the fact does remain that it was faded before and it still faded afterwards, so I would like to find a way of restoring the colour to that Amstrad logo. Also on the right hand side, there's a small patch, it's barely visible, but there is a patch where the plastic is still just a tiny bit darker than the rest. It's hard to see, but it is there. Now we could put this back in for a couple of hours and try to rectify that, but I never think it's a good idea to overdo this process. Trying to fix that small patch may cause another problem for us, and I think there's a fine line to be walked with this process. If it comes out perfect, then that's great. If it comes out nearly perfect, then we really don't want to tempt fate. This is still a vast improvement over how it was before. So happy with that, I can't wait to see it all go back together, so let's reunite the parts. And in doing so I also gave the floppy drive a quick service and removed the old and put some fresh new grease onto the worm screw there. So let's put it all back together and I can show you the result. I'm so excited. Sorry if I've been a bit of a pain while I've been doing all this work Neil. It's looking great. Oh that's nice of you Alan, are you feeling okay? Yeah, you could say I've turned a page. Shut up Alan. <laughs> Turn the page. <laughs> From a yellow crusty mega PC eating itself from the inside out with that leaking battery to a much better looking quieter machine which has been recapped and restored about 99% of the way to completion. On the rear our metalwork is looking so much better. I did have to print a new manufactured by Amstrad sticker above the video port there because it got damaged but that was a small sacrifice for the result I think. And you're probably wondering where my fan controller is and why we have an open ISA slot there. Well quite simply the bracket for our fan controller is just too big for the ISA slot. Even with persuasion it won't fit in there. The controller is tucked inside with the fan turned down at the moment but this problem gave me an idea. Why don't we 3D print a bracket that can accommodate our fan dial, has a slot for our compact flash guard so we can easily access that and a holder to snap our battery into so that we can neatly tie up all of our modern upgrades. So that's something we can certainly do in the final part of this series. Having this lone mega PC from the Swindon Museum of Computing gives us a great side by side comparison. It's an identical machine from the same year and we can see just what a difference our restoration has made. And just look at this, our mega PC is running in 15kHz mega drive mode on a CRT that doesn't support that rate. I need to tweak the picture size and the colour settings admittedly, but it's working and that's thanks to the OSSC converter into which I've plugged an HDMI to VGA adapter. And that gives us a much more authentic CRT experience without the expense of having to find a rare multi-sync monitor. Of course we could also output to a flat panel using the HDMI output, but this really shines on a CRT. It has of course taken a lot of time and effort to come this far, but I'm really pleased with the result and I hope you guys are too. Well I hope you've enjoyed the refurbishment so far, I really have and it's working great, even the floppy disk drive works now. And I tested that out with Counterpoint, this is software that was bundled by Amstrad with the Mega PC and it's kind of a gooey alternative to Windows, it certainly doesn't seem as in depth, but we'll find out in the final part what that's all about. And of course I do still have Windows installed on the hard disk should I want to use it. Now the goal of part four is just to have fun with the machine. I really want to use it. We've had three parts of refurbishment. I want to relax to be honest guys and try and enjoy the machine and get to know it a little better. We will do that 3D printing just to finish it off and I'll put some rubber feet on the bottom and then that's it. It's refurbished. We're going to do no more with it but enjoy it. But saying that to make sure we can maximize the fun in the final part and because we've got a second mega PC here it's, you know, it's, it's quite rare to have two on the same table so let's make the most of that. So I've got these parts. This is a maths coprocessor and we're going to see how much that actually accelerates the machine or doesn't depending on what software we run and this is some additional VRAM or video RAM. So we're going to install those, we're going to see what difference they make and then we can run the two machines side by side 
for a direct comparison and direct benchmarking to see what our upgrades do. I certainly hope you'll join me for that final episode so we can celebrate the machine or machines. And I know now that Alan, as has become tradition in this series, would like to see you out with some more hybrid suggestions. So take it away, Alan. See you next time. Take care, guys. Okay, Neil, drop a fat beat for me, please. Mic check, one, two, one, two. A Game Gear, an all inch. A Super Nintendo, which plays CDs. Nah, Sony won't be interested. A Mattel Aquarius with a rotisserie. An Atari Jaguar with a real Jaguar in it on its back. A Game Boy with a trumpet. A Master System with a B-Day. A CD32 with a beer tap. A Commodore 64 and a disco floor. An Apple Mac in a slice of Raspberry Pi. Sega Saturn with a GPS. CDI and a candy floss machine. A portable computer in your telephone you can put in your pocket. Nah, it's ridiculous. What am I like? No one's going to go for that. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's installation of the Mega PC Restoration. Now, if you watch my channel, it's highly likely that you know what a VPN is. But just to recap quickly, it's a service that offers you a secure tunnel from your device through, in this case, to NordVPN servers. They become your gateway to the internet, making your location, your IP address, and all of your data in that tunnel nice and secure and away from prying eyes. It means your ISP can't see into that tunnel, and therefore they can't shape or throttle your traffic. And with NordVPN settings, you can choose what country it looks like you're in, so you can get around any kind of geolocation blocking. Really useful and something that I've used a lot myself when I've been working abroad to get into services that I pay for here in the UK in my instance, but I can't access because it detects I'm not in the UK. Highly annoying and this is a nice easy solution to get around that as well as having all of those extra security features on top of it. Now I've used a VPN personally for some years and I've recommended it to my friends also ever since I had a role which, well it involved opening firewall ports no questions asked for a huge amount of data from many sources to flow into a data center into which only government scientists had access to, where they would go and do government scientist type things. Without going into the realms of conspiracy theories, what I saw was enough to make me want to take my online security a lot more seriously. And it's also supported on Android and iOS. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you can make sure that you're supported for a small subscription fee, which is made even smaller by the fact that you can now get 75% off by using the coupon code RMC. Just head over to nordvpn.org forward slash RMC to take advantage of that offer. And you can make sure that you're browsing safely and securely online. And then you, like me, can become a naughty boy. Can't believe I just said that. <laughs> just, you know, guys, be smart, be safe. Use a VPN, NordVPN's a great way to do it, and take care.